All righty. Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight. This is a very special edition. Uh, it's not necessarily the creative multiverse, but it is something that we wanted to do and we've been trying to talk about doing for quite some time. And technically, it is kind of a follow up to a stream that I did about four or five months ago called 40 Years After. You can find that way down on my profile. I probably need to find that link and link that guys link it to you for you guys to go out and watch it. But tonight's going to be a really interesting conversation to where we're going to be kind of peeling back the layers of the onion, kind of tearing down the walls. And we have some amazing people already on board that's going to be discussing this with us. But the purpose of tonight's show, tonight's broadcast, is to be able to kind of essentially illuminate what it is that we deal with on a daily basis from chronic illness. And we all suffer to some degree with some sort of chronic illness or something that just plagues us and nags us. And the, the point is, how do we cope with that? What is the warrior within? And what is it to have the heart of a warrior despite everything that we go through? The afflictions, the pain, the, the turmoil, just everything, all the stuff that we have to go through. How do we cope with it? How do we deal with it? Especially as a creative and as somebody that's always trying to push themselves. I've found many ways in my own journey, my own path, and I want to be showing you some of those things and talking about some of those a little bit later tonight in the show. And this is going to be a one-hour broadcast. We're going to kind of keep it short and sweet, but I want to make sure that we have plenty of time tonight to be able to talk to some of these amazing people that we have on board. And uh, with no further ado, I'm going to bring up Mr. Tim Conrad. Uh, Tim has uh, been, man, he has been right there with me for quite some time, for a long time. What's up, dude? How are you doing tonight? Fantastic. How, how are you doing? Dude, I am too blessed to be stressed. Should I should I say anything else other than that? But so you know, we we have been friends for probably a month, month and a half now. We just kind of you just kind of started drawing on one of our streams at the beginning of August, and we're doing this whole art challenge thing called All Ghost. And you came in and started joining, and next thing you know, you're drawing, and now you're posting it on your Instagram account, and you got all kinds of cool things that you're doing with art and. So specifically, I know that we've talked a couple of things in private and, and, and on the streams here and there about some of the things that you go through in your own walk. And, you know, I think I wanted to share my story, but I want to kind of wait towards the end to kind of deal with that. I want to get in your all's minds and in your all's heads on what it is essentially that it is that you, you guys have to deal with and cope with. So if you're willing and if you're able and if you want to, um, what what are some of the things that you deal with on a daily basis? Now, you don't have to give me the coping mechanism right off the bat, but if you want to share, you're more than welcome to. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, no problem. I think everybody that knows me uh, on this platform at least has uh, known that I'm an open book. Um, uh, I had a, a rough year last year coming to terms with who I am uh, in particular. Um, so, you know, just a quick backstory. Um, I was diagnosed with uh, severe depression, um, PTSD, <clears throat> anxiety, of course. And then to, you know, kind of mask all of that, I developed alcoholism. Well, not that you can really develop that, but I definitely perfected it, if you will. Uh, it, it, it runs <clears throat> quite deep in my family. Um, and, you know, I started drinking at an early age uh, and and went hard with it throughout my 20s and into my 30s here. And last year, it came to a head uh, when I was diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis with necrosis, mm. um, meaning... I have killed off about 10% of my pancreas. Um, and that is a, that's a big deal organ. Um, yes. you don't get another one of those and they can't, you know, replace it. Uh, and that won't grow back. And it's, it's literally, it's like the front line of your digestive system. So, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, uh, I drank enough that I, um, kind of, you know, messed all that, gi stuff up and I, I got the pancreatitis the liver counts were terrible um basically my organs were shutting down <clears throat> um but moving forward you know i went to the hospital obviously and um they got me squared away and, and told me you can 
you can never drink again or it will kill you. Like, this is not a joke anymore. This is not a drill. This will kill you. Mm. Uh, so I was fine and happy with that for about all oh, two weeks after I got out of my 11 day stay in the hospital. Um, and then it, the drinking, uh, the addictive brain uh, kicked back into high gear and started saying that eh, it's going to be okay. You know, you're, you can, you can handle a drink here and there and all that. And uh, the next thing I knew I was full, full on back into it. And uh, I wound up back in the hospital again. And uh, that was the point where I realized this is way out of my control and I don't want to die. Um, so I need to, I need to get some help. So I went and I went and had a stay at an inpatient rehab facility um, for 44 days total. Wow. Uh, learned a lot about me, learned a lot about what is going on in my brain mm -hmm. <clears throat> that makes me the way that, you know, I am. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I've been, uh, dealing with that, uh, still dealing with the pancreatitis. It, as long as I stay off the, the alcohol, mm -hmm. every, everything should be okay. That's yeah. the, that's the normal. Level, yeah. Yeah. So the, the liver counts and stuff have, 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 uh, healed. Um, praise God. Yes. The, the liver will, uh, heal itself kind of like the, the lungs. If you quit smoking mm -hmm. um, over time, you can balance things back out. Now the pancreas uh, is, is gone forever. What I've done to that is, is now with me forever. But the good news is the doc said that um, everything, I should still live a normal life if I stay off of the alcohol. Wow, man. Well, just listening to your story, dude, I am just so freaking inspired. Uh, because yeah, you know, I, I, I can't imagine walking in your shoes and there's no way I can even begin to compare or try to. Um, but I, I, you were mentioned something in there that, that definitely resonated with me and that was depression. Um, that has been something that I've dealt with probably for the past on and off eight years. Um, and it's some days, man, it just rocks me to my core. There's days I can't even, I don't even get off the couch. I don't even want oh my gosh, I just, I can't eat. I can't focus. Mm -hmm. I can't feel any drive to do anything. And, um, I can definitely relate with you, but I'm so proud of you, man. And, and the journey that, that you've come on in, in, in treating, you know, kind of staying away from it. But the big thing is that you actually went to the facility for 40, 45, 44 days and you got the help that you needed and you kind of realized the things and the probably the systems that you needed to have in place in your own life to make that to make that turn to do that 180 and um was i gotta ask you really quick was there was there a pinnacle moment in your life like that made you realize that you needed to go into the facility was there a moment a turnaround there was there was that um i guess it's the rock bottom moment if you will um mm it was right before I went into the hospital for the second time. Um, and okay. I was, I was pretty drunk. <laughs> um, and I was standing in my living room, uh, and my wife was, well, at the, at the time she was my fiance. <clears throat> um, but I, I was, I was, uh, I was drunk and my side was hurting again. So it, it was the left flank, upper flank. I mean, right. just a, just a terrible pain, something I, I wish on nobody. Um, and I'm like, I'd done it again. And my fiance at the time, now wife, she's like, what, what are you talking about? And I just kind of collapsed to the floor, melted into a puddle, as I say. And mm. I was, I started crying and I'm like, this is completely out of my control. I'm drinking again. And, you know, yeah, I mean, I was just floored. She was floored. Uh, and I, you know, that was the point in time where I did realize also that I didn't want to die, um, yeah. because the depression and, and what have you from before, I mean, yeah. there was always the, I was never, I never had suicidal ideation, but I had what they call passive death wish, which is basically like, you're not going to do anything yourself, but if something were to come along, you're not going to hinder it. <laughs> uh, oh man, um, that's, uh. 
that's a deep, dark canon there. I'll share a little bit of my story. You know, I grew up with a, a lot of medical conditions and I'm, I'm going to share this and then we'll get Chrissy in here as well. Sure. Um, but I, you know, I, I share, I have a lot of medical conditions that I deal with on a daily basis. It's not just one. It is this ongoing cocktail, if you will, of just disaster. Um, and the fact I'm even here having this conversation with you today, Tim, is this anything short of a miracle, but you know, I was born the hemophiliac and I got HIV and hepatitis C at age two. So right off the bat, I've been dealing with that. And I've always had this men like subdued mental notion that I've always been damaged goods that I, I, I was never good enough. I was never, never worthy of anything that I, I didn't really, you know, I don't deserve that. I don't need this. There's not that. And, and it was always this ongoing thing that I just kept trying to nip it in the bud as much as I could. And then long story short, probably about, it was right after I got cured of hepatitis C in 2014, I began feeling this, like I got cured of this one thing, but now there's another thing that's just totally masking everything. And that's chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Every day I wake up, I am just reeling in pain. And um, thank you guys so much for the awards on the left. I love you so much. Thanks, Gerald Bittenart. Thanks, Michael Murray, Lindsey Badger. And so dealing with that, it's, it's hard for me to focus and concentrate when your body is throbbing to the point that mm -hmm. every time your heart beat, you, your joints are throbbing. It's hard to explain with hemophilia, but it's, it's one of those things. And I mean, I, I really started remorsing it within myself and being depressed. I'm like, oh, my God. And those thoughts about like, you're not good enough. You're not worthy enough. And, you know, I, I never will say that I, I, like you, I never had any kind of thoughts of suicide or anything like that. But what was that term you said that it was a subcon like a subconscious mental state that passive death wish? Thank you. So that um, there was a point and I wrote about this in my book, but I'm going to share it here with you guys. Um, spoiler alert. There was a point in my life where I wanted to stop taking my HIV pills and we all know what happens if you do that, right? You stop taking them, AIDS will progress, mm -hmm. and you will die. Essentially, it's pharmaceutical suicide, if you think about it. And uh, it was a very dark spot to be in, in my life. And there was a point in my life before I got married where I was going through those mental states of, uh, you know, I'm, no woman's going to have me. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. And the older I get, the worse it's going to get. And it was just one snowball thing after another and insert depression on top of that chronic anxiety. I'm not just talking normal anxiety. I'm like talking anxiety to the point to where you cough uncontrollably, like your lungs are seizing almost. It was crazy, but I feel you on that. Um, I, I understand where you're coming from to an extent, although I've not walked in your shoes. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I truly, man, I'm so proud of you though, to see you on here and, and smiling and laughing with us on the nights that we do art. It's just such a blessing. I want you to know that dude. It's a lot of fun and I appreciate y'all having me. All righty. Well, we're going to bring up Chrissy. Where's Chrissy? Hello, Chrissy. Oh, right here. <laughs> how are you doing, my oh. dear? Okay. How are you? Oh, it's good to see you tonight. Mm -hmm. Are it's you, good to uh, be here. are you, uh, where are you now you're in Pennsylvania, right? Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh. And then Tim, where are you from? Frederick, Maryland. Maryland. Okay. Oh. Okay. Well I I'm lived a, for a short spell in Pax River, Maryland. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I am a Floridian. So there is that. <laughs> That's all I gotta say for you. And we'll just leave that right there. But Chrissy, you kind of get the gist of what we're talking about here tonight. And you and I have had some really good heart-to-heart, late, late night conversations as of as of recently. Um, share one, share a little bit about your story if you want to. Oh, sure. Um, and then I'll share an odd parallel I discovered. Um, I was born uh, ill. I was born with broken and bilaterally dislocated hips. Um, a septate uterus, which didn't matter till later in life. Um, I have three kidneys. So Wait, this is all basically kidneys? from an autoimmune disorder that I had uh, when I was um, in utero. 
where, you know, you start out with two sets of most organs when you're a fetus. Mm -hmm. And then as you come together, they come into the normal amount. Well, mine never completed the entire journey, I guess. Wow. Uh, so I was sick a lot as a baby, um, all the way up until about four. Uh, I would go through these spells where I'd be horribly sick. And I would like, my mom said, described it as Linda Blair vomiting. And uh, as a baby. <laughs> it's just like, okay. It was bad. Well, then when I was uh, four, I got really sick. And uh, it was just lasting too long. And my parents didn't like it. And uh, so they decided to um, take me to the hospital. And uh, they made an appointment with the doctor. Well, then before the appointment came, um, I went into kidney failure one night. And uh, they ended up, they took me to Todd's Children's Hospital in Ohio. And uh, the doctor there said, you know, our renal um, capabilities aren't as, uh, aren't as advanced as uh, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. So they sent me to Children's Hospital. And uh, at Children's Hospital, I ran into a doctor, I'll never forget, his name was Dr. Rice. And uh, doctor um, happened to be the one that was in the ER when I came in. Uh, he recognized when my that my kidneys were shutting down and that um, I was likely that the other organs were going to follow. Mm. And then uh, he discovered that the uh, problem was that uh, when I was born, my... Um, the ureters are the tubes that go to your bladder between mm -hmm. your bladder and uh i was born without valves on my ureters oh, so wow. there was nothing to stop basically all those years i was throwing up i was being poisoned by myself wow yeah so it just for that reason it was lucky i got to him and the other reason was he said I noticed some other things and he said, and if you don't mind, I'd like to look into something else because I just did a seminar on it, but I think I know what's causing these other problems. And okay. she, they were like, sure. And he came back and he told them that uh, I very definitely had the markers for a disorder in the United States, which is called autoimmune polyendocrinopathy syndrome. Type 3C is the one that I have which by the way happens to be one of the rarest because i'm not lucky uh wow <laughs> but um and uh, yeah that's a joke really i'm uh, it's no but, I, uh, I, I i get it i'm the lucky one too yeah so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh so i you know i ended up all through my childhood i was uh chronically ill off and on um i had bouts of healthiness uh and then um I got a little older, it caused other problems. I, I noticed, you know, that Tim mentioned the addiction issues mm. and I went through that also. Um, part of it, I was self-medicating it. Part of it was the passive death wish and part of it was culminating in, in an actual death wish. And uh, mostly that came from when I was younger, uh, my parents were told, you know, when they took me home from the hospital, basically take her home and enjoy her while you have her. There's nothing we can do. Wow. And uh, then I went through all of that and I made it to four. And then at four, they almost lost me. And then uh, I continued to be chronically ill. Uh, there's a, a really neat parallel that I just discovered between you and I, Joseph. What is that, my dear? I was uh, reading your story, um, you know, checking things out. So I was up to, and uh, I was diagnosed with my autoimmune disorder um, in the 80s. Okay. And uh, there was nothing known about it. And I felt ashamed. I didn't know what to say when kids asked about it. And one day... I watched this movie with my mom about oh, no. this little boy named Ryan White. Ryan White. 
Yeah, I had no idea. That's just... Yeah. I, I don't know, like, he inspired me to fight anyway. I have his magazine no hanging up behind me. Think, yeah, oh, really? Yeah, I'll show it to you at the end of the show here in a minute. But that really... Um, I know the gravity of the situation as far as, you know, well, yes, there was somebody who had it, but mm. they passed already. And yeah. you're like going, 42. you know, well, yeah. so what? I'm just a walking time bomb. You know, it, it, it can be hard to cope with. And that's, uh, that's the way I felt, at I, least. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I remember sitting there in front of the TV and watching that movie and just sobbing. And was like, somebody else knows. Because I didn't know anybody who had any sort of rare illness. And uh, then, like, all this time has passed. And about two weeks ago, I was reading an article um, in a magazine about Ryan White. And uh, so when I found out, then looking into you that you that connection it just kind of blew my mind yeah but um yeah i remember praying for him yeah ryan and i um you know side tangent ryan and i we lived extremely parallel lives we both grew up in very rural towns he grew up in kokomo indiana i grew up in a little town called whitesburg kentucky in in, in appalachia and for some reason, the reason Ryan got the limelight in the public eye on the Phil Donahue show on Oprah and CNN back in the day is because he was banned from school because because of his hemophilia, he contracted AIDS and the school board voted to ban him out because they didn't understand the disease. And very easily, Chrissy, that could have been me uh, in a lot of those instances that could have definitely been me because you know, if, if something would have happened with my school board. But the thing that I think the thing that really saved my hind end was the doctors at University of Kentucky, where I was treated at the time, told my mom and dad, uh, whatever you do, don't let it out in your community that he has hemophilia. Because if he has because you turn on CNN nightly news between 82 and 85, it was it was all mm -hmm. well, probably 89, essentially. It was all over the headlines, you know, Ryan White to the 14 year old from Kokomo, Indiana, Indiana. You know, you get all this news and he was everywhere. And then there was another one, Ricky Ray. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but he was from here in Arcadia, yeah. Florida, and he had two other brothers. So they're all three hemophiliacs and they all three got AIDS and they all three uh, ended up perishing, unfortunately. A very sad and tragic story. Now, Chrissy, um, you had talked about like being in the hospital. Were, were you in a hospital a lot as a kid growing up, or was it just one of those things you went routinely? How did that look for you? No, I spent a lot of time in and out of hospitals, uh, mostly yeah. because they knew what I had, but they didn't know enough about what I had to know what to do. Right. And uh, there were all kinds of, you know, uh, guesses or, well, this is also an autoimmune disease and it reacts like this. So let's try this. And uh, a lot of it, um, for me, a lot of my issues now came out of that. Got you. Okay. Um, oh, where'd you go? I'm right here. Oh, okay. I can't see you. I don't know what happened. It was just, oh, there we go. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're good, girl. I didn't even touch it. See, that's, uh, that's so wild, though, because I, I feel that there's yet another parallel between you and I, because I spent literally half of my life from the time I was born to probably 24, 25 at University of Kentucky Hospital. I was also in and out of the Ronald McDonald houses. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Uh, but that is a, a thing, a charitable organization set up by the McDonald's Foundation that allows families that are unable to stay extended stays near a hospital to actually stay on campus at a Ronald McDonald's house. So, yeah, um, you know, it's just one of those things. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I was reading the comment on the side there. Um, but, uh, yeah, so how do you... How, how does man so let's fast forward to today how how are you doing today let's let, let's get the update um 
Okay, well, today I would be what's uh, considered terminally ill. Um, I, about three, four years ago, after my fourth bout of sepsis, I um, decided that I was going to stop taking the chemotherapy pill and the biologic that was the cause of all my problems. Mm. And uh, it apparently was too late. My uh, autoimmune reaction figured out a way to use the uh, good bacteria in my gut and release it into my bloodstream. Oh, And so I would go chronic sepsis, like, you know, I think there was only one time that I had it that I didn't actually like literally drop because I just happened to be in the wheelchair at that point. But um, yeah, it hits no warning. You know, um, like I said, it's been four times. The last time was um, nine, er, 19, 2018. Um, and I was just lucky that a friend of mine I'd known for 20 years that I was staying with her. It was about a year after my mom passed. And uh, my dad told her later that my mom was the one that knew all my stuff. And he said that, you know, he didn't realize until this happened that how much he didn't know. Well, my friend apparently just from watching and, and listening all those years of being my friend knew exactly what to do and told them all the information they needed. And uh, so here I am again. Uh, but I am very, um, I don't. I don't ever really sit down anymore. I mean, there were points at, at one point where I was suicidal. Mm -hmm. um, I was also dealing with uh, bipolar disorder, which uh, was diagnosed pretty young. And uh, so I think that at some point I just got knocked down and I was tired of getting knocked down. So I was either going to decide to just get up and run no matter what happened or i was yeah. just gonna lay there forever and give up and i just put my running shoes on my god and i'm so glad you did because we're having this conversation together today you and i are here right now in this moment talking to each other and you know a lot of people ask me like joe how how do you how do you do it and i'm not saying this with any sort of like i don't want the limelight on me I never want the limelight on me. But in all reality, I do deal with a lot of crap on a daily basis. Sometimes it takes me 15, 20 minutes just to get out of the bed in the morning because when I lay down at night, my hips, everything, my muscles and my hips, they kind of reside in this position. And when you have joint deformity, like the way I do here, you see, you can see I got muscle atrophy um, and all of that from hemophilia. So my body kind of, it takes a while for my body to get going. It takes a while for me to get in motion and to get limber and loose to where I can even go to the restroom, or hop in the shower, and, you know, and, and do the normal routines. But you said something earlier, you know, you, you got this drive, Chrissy, that, that it's in you. That's almost, it's like a blind drive. Like you, you know, you got to keep pushing forward despite all the odds. And there's, it's almost, it's almost like for me, there's this innate thing that's dwelling inside of me that's almost wanting to push the fact that I'm sick aside and not even acknowledging the fact I'm sick. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have to take the pills every day. Yes, I have to infuse in my belly every week this this synthetic thing so I can clot like a normal human. But and then I have to take a lot of pain medication, whether that be medical cannabis or opioid. I have to do a combination of both. And I'm just being transparent, but there's almost this stubbornness, if you will, that that is in me. Like, I don't really want to acknowledge the fact that I'm sick. Only when I'm depressed is when I'm reminded that I'm sick. And, you know, it, it's weird it, it, when when I'm sitting on the couch and I'm in pain. I can't even watch something on the television. I can't even focus on drawing. I can't even talk to my mom no more than 60 seconds. Mom, I'm just not feeling good. i got to let you go. That's nothing a son wants to do to a mother. See, for me, my mom is a one of the reasons why I'm here today because she was 
literally the rocket fuel. Let me paint a picture for you. So Lexington is in the center of the state of Kentucky, all right? We lived in rural Appalachia, three and a half hours away. There's no hospital in, in where I lived that knew how to treat somebody that had not only had hemophilia, but was co-infected with HIV hepatitis C. I had to drive three and a half hours north to Lexington every appointment, sometimes three times a week we had to do this. And the reason I say that about my mom is my mom, she would get us up at 3.45 a.m., we would leave, and we would be there at my appointment by 9 o'clock. And sheesh, my gosh, I, I, if, you know, and you think about, you know, the times that she calls, and I should be thankful, but I can't be thankful because the pain is making me stubborn and bitter, and, and there's, then I get depressed, and then I go into this, this cycle, and it lasts a week or two, and, and then I slowly start to snap out of it, and, and, uh, holy cow, there, I can go on. Tim, does any of this resonate with you? Is there anything that you want to add to this discussion? You, you've been silent for like 15 minutes here. No, it's all good. Uh, I, I can definitely relate with the whole mom thing. Uh, my mom had to sit on the sidelines and watch this progress in me. Um, and, you know, when when you have a child that's addicted to something, anything, you really can't uh, – force you know help on them you can't you can't make them better right. you have to you have to sit back and watch and and let them come to the realization and let them reach out for the help um so i can uh i can attest that uh my mom i probably shaved years off of her life uh just waiting for me to to, to come to that realization and uh, God bless my mom too. She stayed by my side through this whole thing, even yeah. when, uh, even when it seemed like everything else was falling apart. Um, mom was always there. Yeah, God bless her mothers, man. You know, and and here's the sad thing: the doctors had actually told my mom and dad around age five or six on my end that he's not going to live past the age of sixteen you might want to go ahead and start making preparations in advance. And it wasn't until after I graduated high school, getting closer to the age of 19 at this point, that my mom and dad actually confided and, and let the cat out the bag. Is like, you know, here's your, here's your funeral arrangements. We, we were, we were planning for this because here's the thing, you know, the AIDS epidemic, Literally, it, it it's overshadowing anything. I mean, I would even go just dare to say it might be even more severe than than COVID nineteen. Though COVID nineteen is 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 now becoming its own beast and morphing into different ways. Um, I won't go down that rabbit hole. But with 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 the AIDS epidemic back then, between remember this guys between eighty one and ninety three, there was no medication on the market to treat HIV AIDS. There was nothing, not until 94. And so remember all the people that got infected. And, you know, you got Freddie Mercury, you got Rock Hudson, you got all these famous people that were just succumbing to this disease. And it was one after another after another. And uh, it, it was just ridiculous. And that was what – so you think about this. My mom and dad are watching the news in the, in the mid eighties and they're turning on and another person just died of AIDS. And yet here's their son who has that same exact thing. Can you even begin to fathom, you know what? I can't, I can't, and not as a parent because I'm not a parent. So I can't even put my, wrap my head around that. I can't but either. that's what I had to deal with. You know, it's not. Yeah. Chrissy, you got anything else you want to add? Because we're going to, we're going to start talking about how we cope. We're going to transition. Yeah. To conversation. Um, yeah, it's just crazy, the parallels. I actually have another account I do uh, medical marijuana awareness mm -hmm. stuff on, and my name on that account is Indica Alice. Nice. I've living my whole life in the rabbit hole. I'm Sativa Steve. Uh-uh. <laughs> no, I'm just joking with There's you. There's Sativa Steve. <laughs> I know. No, I'm, actually, I'm Hybrid Herman. I'm, hybrid oh, Herman. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Herman the Hybrid. hybrid yeah. Herman. Yeah. No, I'm just, go ahead, continue. I just messed you up. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. But, um, yeah, ultimately, my uh, 
problems led me to um, the one of the times that I passed, I was not conscious. I couldn't make decisions for myself or anything. Mm-hmm. And that was when they ended up putting me on opiates. Yeah. And I had 23 years of sobriety when that happened. And I woke up extremely angry and I swore I would get rid of the opiates. Even if it meant dying, I was not doing them. And that was when around when medical marijuana became legal in my state. And I actually used the medical marijuana to wean off of the opiates. Yeah. Same. Um, yeah. Yeah. 20, so 2017 I, was, I, our, was, was the year our state got it. Yeah. Yeah, that's about, yeah, it was about three years ago now. But, um, yeah, now we move on to coping. <laughs> okay, no, no, you're good. Uh, Tim, you got anything else you want to add to, to the conversation? Uh, I am good so far. Okay. I- well, I want to share something with you guys, and, and I'm going to let Chrissy and Tim share here in a minute. But this is something that I began doing. Hey, Pablo, what's up, my buddy? Um, thank you for uh, joining you know. us tonight. Um, we we're talking about coping with chronic illnesses and Pablo, you need to go back and definitely check out the first 40 minutes of this stream. Holy cow. It's been good. But one of the things, you know, here's the thing. Um, when I start having these moods of being depressed and, 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 and I'm, the anxiety starts creeping in and uh-huh. I can feel that, that nervousness in, in my body, I can feel that twitch and my lungs start to seize up a little bit and it, it happens. I mean, there's very some of the most weirdest and stupid stuff will trigger this. But I began doing something that it is connected to my faith in a way, but it's something that reminds me every day of where I was, where I've been, and where I'm going, if that reminds. And I've started doing journaling, Mm -hmm. and I got this journal, and um, this journal um, is really kind of – and I have other ones. This is my newest one. But for me, it, it kind of – it's written in my own hand, so I can go back and see all those moments when, you know, crap at the fan that I can talk about it. But I write down all of my thoughts, all of my prayers, all of my anger. I Sometimes I'll, I'll have a scripture verse up here that I'll highlight and um, just kind of reflect on it and meditate on it. But – it's really cool for me, though, because all those moments when I think that the world is crashing down on me and I'm panicking and I can go back in this and I can find a moment from my life where I'm like, OK, so I was going through this same exact thing literally two years ago and I'm I'm alive now. I'm well. I'm happy. I got through it. It's OK, Joe. It's okay. And so for me, it kind of serves as this is ongoing reminder that, you know, no matter what I go through and at just this past weekend, I was going through some, some gastrointestinal issues and I wrote down my frustrations, my angers. And I was just like crying out to God. I was like, what is going on? I can't eat a meal. Um, I went for like 48 hours this weekend. I couldn't eat. I don't know why. I still don't know why, but, um, I write it down and, and, and there's been moments and I, I wrote down on my blog um, also on I strive to thrive.com the entire, when I was getting cured of, of hepatitis C, which was a six month cancer style therapy. I blogged about every doctor's appointment, every lab test, every, the whole journey. I can always go back on my website and look, and I, I'm a blogger. I'm a writer. It's what I do. And but for me, it's kind of a way, it's one of the ways that I deal with it, but I get it out there into the universe and I get it out in my own words from my own pen or my own hand. And it just helps me as a constant reminder that hey, this was the season you were in and you're okay today. You know, no matter what you went through, you're still, you're still a warrior. You still got the heart of the warrior. You're pushing through. It's going to be tough. Some days are going to be better than other days but you got this. And so it's a constant reminder for me and other things too. Obviously you guys have seen me on late night here on haps. You know, I love doing art. Art is another way that I deal with chronic pain 
and stress and anxiety and depression. It seems like when I draw, the my hand just goes and I just lose all sense of reality. Sometimes my wife will touch me on the shoulder because I'm listening to the music and I'm so into what I'm doing. I just lose all sense of reality around me. But I want to go to Chrissy. Uh, Chrissy, what are some of those ways and mechanisms that you do? I know you, you like me, you sound like you got the trifecta of doom. So we got, we were the trifecta <laughs> team. Yeah, we got that right. going on. <laughs> I tell um, people that all the time. Yeah, I'm man. sorry, but I happen to know I'm better than you. <laughs> That's exactly right. So what do you do? How do you how do you cope with with your day to day? Because I know that you go through a lot. We've had some deep discussions and I just I'm really anxious to hear what you have to say. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it started out. I also had a warrior mom and, mm. uh, you know, she all but threatened the doctor's life when he told her that there was a place for kids like me to go. And uh, <laughs> that was when I was a baby, though, if you could imagine somebody telling you to give up your baby. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was younger, like uh, from birth to five, even being sick was what I called like my years of golden innocence because I was fostered very much to be creative, artistic, you know, do whatever. I had older siblings that were much older than me that uh, taught me things. And uh, so really mine came from like uh beautiful distractions mm -mm, beautiful like, distractions. Uh, okay yeah like my art um i was an artist i went to college for graphic design and Ooh, uh, wait you're a graphic designer yeah we did this last time too oh i said oh wait you're a graphic designer and, yeah <laughs> oh wait well, I, I just totally forgot about that little portion of That's your okay. life. That's okay. I forget okay. things Holy five God. minutes ago. All right. There's, yeah. another, there's another parallel. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, the thing about my art was, like, I could do my art and people could see my art without seeing me. So mm. it wasn't like there was always this connotation of death around everything I did. And uh, it, it's... um. I think, like you said, I don't really think about it a whole lot, except for um, I have a lot of anxiety at night and I have severe insomnia because I have two fears when I lay down. One is that I'm not going to wake up and my dad's going to find me if it happens in my sleep. And the other one is um, having to, to suffer, I guess. Um, and when I go to bed at night, I know that when I go to bed at night, I'm going to wake up in the morning in pain. And uh, I know now how to quickly bring that pain under control. But um, I still get the anxiety when I go to bed at night of, you know, if you fall asleep, you're going to wake up in pain and you're going to start mm -hmm. it all over again. So especially if I was not hurting, it would be easier to just not sleep. Yeah. Plus, I'm on a lot of medications that cause insomnia same absolutely the same yeah um i i i'm on a hiv meds one of them particularly is called bictarvi and mm -hmm. uh it does mess with my psyche from time to time and and you know i don't know if you guys know anything about hiv meds but oh my gosh they can be toxic you know they've gotten better but the insomnia part i mean i hear that train coming it's coming <laughs> oh, around the bend that? I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know when. Well, I'm stuck in Baltimore, Maryland. Time keeps dragging. No, sorry. I just totally went Johnny Cash there on you guys. Mr. Cash. <laughs> we'll take down Chris. All right. So, so Tim, uh, share with us a little bit about some <coughs> of your coping me mechanisms and, and how you deal with your day to day. Oh, it's, uh, it's a lot of grounding. Um, just making sure. That, you know, I, whenever I do feel like stressing or wanting, wanting that drink or mm -hmm. anything of that sort, you got to bring yourself back to center. I got you. Um, you got to bring that, bring, bring everything uh, back to uh, square one. Right. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, through, you know, mindfulness uh, techniques and, you know, taking a, a nice walk outside, just kind of chilling out. Um, 
the biggest thing that I do to help me cope day to day is what I consider to be 12th step work. Mm. Um, the 12th step of Alcoholics Anonymous being, you know, having had a spiritual awakening, we now go forth and share uh, our our source experience, strength and hope with others to help them along their way. So, I mean, I started, um, I've been approached by my union here um, to help spearhead a peer support group for our first responders here. Um, we from there have branched off and opened up a legitimate first responders AA meeting here in Frederick, um, which I am a co-host of. That's and then, awesome. And then on top of that, uh, I found this wonderful HAPS platform, you know, where oh, yeah. I, I come on and I can chill out with you guys, uh, you know, just bounce from stream to stream, say what's up to everybody or do my own show, which uh, I've been running now for 13 weeks. And uh, Gemma and I do the mental health hour. And basically it's taking all of that information that I was given and learned in, in my inpatient stay and kind of dispersing it each week on a, on a different topic. This week we did depression, mm -hmm. uh, speaking of. And um, it's just everything that culminated over this past year. Um, I just want to get that information out as much as I can to help anybody else that might feel alone. Because um, that's the biggest thing. I think you mentioned it at the beginning of the broadcast is that th these are – these are these diagnoses are no different than anybody else's. And there's no, no reason to be ashamed of anything. No. no reason to be ashamed of who you are, the cards you were dealt. And we're all out here together. And yeah. uh, I, I, that's my big thing. I want everybody to know that they're not alone and that we're here. That's so good, man. And, you know, we aren't alone. And, and, and there there are times I, I get down on myself. It's more easier to get down on myself. Than, than than to get up and out of my mental state if that makes sense and um like i said earlier though good days and bad days and uh chrissy uh did did the train uh did the train go by are you good there is, is, that was actually my dad's phone which is never in my room and he That's just left awesome. it in here that was actually him calling well, to find it well they, they got to hear me they got to hear me sing years. some johnny cash so there is that on the side yeah. so but uh, so coping mechanisms, we're talking about coping mechanisms. And um, mm -hmm. I, I love the show that you're doing, Tim, and I, I, I applaud you for your efforts. I mean, talking about that, it's so good to peel back that onion and just kind of reveal those layers and getting down to the core of who we are. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important. Uh, a lot of us, you know, in ministry work, we call them wounds and there's different layers of wounds. There's a mother wound. There's a father wound. There's there, there's all many different types of things that we have to go through, not necessarily from parents. It could be somebody else. It could be uh, something that we did traumatic, you know, as, as a child. But there's all those types of things that we have to. Well, the innate human ability is that we we submerge them deep into our conscious, into our psyche. And slowly over years and over time, they begin to eat away at us. They begin to kind of gnaw away. And and that because we're submitting that to you know deep down and not we're not healing from it it's making us who we are it's making some of us it's making us bitter it's making us depressed we're having anxiety issues because of that and so i applaud you for for what you're doing and uh that show man and i wish you guys success and i'm going to play you. your uh, your outro at the end of the show i'm going to play that for you Awesome. Uh, so we'll we'll do that chrissy uh any other coping mechanisms that you use or or to help you through your day to day. Um, yeah, I actually uh, write as well. Oh, cool. I do um, poetry and uh, stories and other stuff, which started from being in the hospital and first falling in love with reading books. And then uh, the best way out for me was always in my mind. Mm -hmm. So I would read books and then be like stuck on one book for weeks. And then I would like, draw maps through treasure island and you know and wow. i would see it all in my head as though i'd really been there and so i started writing poetry at a pretty young age and then it just kind of stuck with me i journal as well i'm not doing very good at that lately but i i do do that 
you don't have to do it every day. I don't think, I, you know, a lot of, that's, oh, that's no. kind of the setup to fail. Cause if you do it, if you, if you put it in your mind, I got to do this every day. And then if you get in that mentality, then you're, you're going to fall, you're going to fall mm -hmm. away from it. Oh yeah. But in the moment when things are happening, that's the moment I pull out my journal. And, you know, when the pen hits the paper, that's when I begin to write. And I begin to, you know, just kind of get all that out and purge all of that. What's up, Troy? Welcome to the chat. But, um, I mean, it's awesome. And it's so important that we have these ways to deal with what we go through. I know, you know, Tim's doing a show. I do art. And I'm just a big nerd. So there is that. And then, you know, Chrissy, I mean, are you still doing graphic design? Or are you are you dabbling into any kind of the art no. of the creative? Um. Well, yeah, I do still do collaging, which I actually learned when I was 16 in, a, in rehab. And, collaging? Uh, yeah, uh, I have these uh, collages where I cut stuff out of magazines and I put them on there and then uh, put a lay over the top. But um, just it's not so much the uh, collage, it's the uh, what goes along with it. Um, right. There's a you message. You know what I was thinking me. when I did it. Yeah, it's kind of like journaling with pictures, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. So I do that. And What's I have up, four Jeremy? cats. You have four cats. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. Well, you know, guys, I want to remind everybody um, out there that's just joining in. If 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 you're just getting here and they're like, what are they talking about? Uh, Chrissy, Tim, and myself, we've just kind of been very transparent the last hour. We've we've peeled back who we are and in an effort and hopes to be able to help somebody out there that's going through the same thing. I know one of the biggest things right now that, that a lot of us have to face is anxiety and depression. And cases of that is going literally through the roof right now. There's so many people that are that are just kind of lost in their way and, and they're dealing with all this stuff and they don't know how to, how to cope with it. They don't know how to funnel it into something that is productive to help them. I don't want to say necessarily the word distract them from what is going on, but to kind of give them enough push in the right direction to help them through that season of what they're, what it is that they're going through. And, um, but I really applaud both of you guys and I want to thank you both so much for being on here tonight and i want to thank you for your willingness to share it is not easy getting on a stream or presenting in front of people and opening up hey this is who i am this is what i got and here you go uh it took me a long time to do that i tell you hmm. but uh, you guys got any anything else you want to add any kind of closing comments or something we we forgotten didn't discuss um Go ahead if you had one. No, I was uh, just going to go ahead, Tim. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to echo the journaling thing. I mean, uh, I left that one out, but you guys covered it pretty well. It, one of, By far, one of the most therapeutic things I brought home from rehab was journaling, and yeah, I still man. do it today. It's not every day like it was because, you know, you can only talk about the stuff so much, but whenever something significant does happen, it, I am journaling. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I, you know, it's funny. Uh, I'll take my journal when I'm on a plane or when I'm on travel mode or I'm at my local coffee shop or even, even at, ha in, at, at church or wherever, you know, I'll, I'll take it with me. And when, when those moments arise where I feel that there is an urgency to document the date, the time and what's going on around me, I'll always get that journal out. And um, if you guys um, won't mind, I, I got a I got a scripture I'm going to share if that's cool. Uh, yeah. Um, but this is one of my favorites, and a lot of times I go back to this to remind myself. This uh, we're talking about chronic illness. We're talking about coping with chronic chronic illness, and the heart of a warrior within. And one of my favorite scriptures comes from Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse nine, and it's basically it, it, it sums up everything, but. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, this is the Apostle Paul talking. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, 
then I am strong. It's a great verse. Yeah. And Ooh. it really, you know, it reminds me, yeah, I am weak. I'm not strong, but I, I can be strong spiritually. I can be strong mentally. Um, there's so many ways you can, you can interpret that to kind of help you through your day. But I, I love how it just talks about, you know, hey, we're, none of us are the same. We all deal with things in our own way, and we all have our own coping mechanisms. And I, hopefully that, that gives you a little encouragement. Like, despite our weaknesses, we can be we, – we can have the stride of a lion. And yeah. still be sick as a dog, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Yep. So 100. But mm -hmm. um, but I want to thank everybody in the chat, man. We're going to wrap this thing up. It's almost at the <laughs> top of the hour. I wanted to keep this one hour, but um, uh, Chrissy Katz, girl, this has been a honor to be on here with you, mm -hmm. and I, I'm hoping we can do this again. Maybe do a part two to this and come back and oh, and, and and with Tim as well. Maybe we can get together on. Maybe we can do this on your show next time. Absolutely. Uh, you know, or, or yeah, I don't yeah. know, but I, I think it's important that we continue this dialogue, that we continue this conversation because I know there's people on this platform that are going through a lot. COVID isn't helping anything. Let me tell you, COVID is kind of making things a lot more worse and it's kind of exacerbating the whole thing about anxiety and depression. And, you know, should I do this? Should I do not? Should I? So uh, trust me, I get it. And it's good that we talk about these things civilly. Um, mm -hmm. and to be able to talk about it, but, um, Hey, you're welcome over there, Troy, but, um, we're going to go ahead and close out, but I do want to say a huge thank you to everyone. Before we do that, though, we're going to roll Tim's promo. I got to see this promo here. So let's check this thing out here. Let's, and we'll be right back after the promo. We'll do official close out, but let's check this thing out. So this is for your show, Tim. Yes, it is. All right. Well, let's do it. Here we go. Radical acceptance is knowing that drinking alcohol uh -oh. will kill you and then making a decision based off of that. So is there a video to it? There was supposed to be. If you did something and you have to do something to change that, do that and move on from it. Otherwise, like you say, you'll just drive yourself mad. Sam. When I got on the phone, she had told me that he had OD'd from fentanyl that night, and she had found him in the morning on his bed with his lips blue. When you increase that negativity, you increase the avoidance and the isolation mm -hmm. and the detachment. They all seem to fall into a, like a, a circle with each other. So you do more of one and then the rest just follow. Absolutely. Um, hmm. Wow. You know, I think we need to rerun that. Yeah, I put up another one. We'll see if that one works it better. There we go. Oh, I can see it now. Acceptance is knowing that drinking alcohol will kill you and then making a decision based off of that. If you did something and you have to do something to change that, do that and move on from it. Otherwise, like you say, you'll just drive yourself mad. When I got on the phone, she had told me that he had OD'd from fentanyl that night, and she had found him in the morning on his bed with his lips blue. When you increase that negativity, you increase the avoidance and the isolation mm -hmm. and the detachment. They all wow. seem to fall into a, like a, a circle with each other. So you do more of one, and then the rest just follow. Absolutely. Um, wow, dude. Congratulations, man. That's big. Yeah. I apologize the first. No, moment. no, don't apologize, bro. It, it's probably something on my end. I have no idea. But, but uh, dude, that's powerful. What a powerful intro that is. Man, thanks for sharing that with us. Absolutely. We've been, uh, this was our 13th week of it where it's really catching steam. And I'm glad that everybody keeps tuning in to, to keep that conversation going. And yeah, like you absolutely. Said. Well, Chrissy, Tim, I'm going to let you guys go for the night. Uh, we're going to, in about 25 minutes, we're going to be over on Art with Badges. Mm -hmm. She's going to be setting up an art stream, and we're just going to continue that conversation over there. 
but from the literally for, to the both of you and to all those in the chat room and to those who who supported with a little uh, with a little support thing there, I really do appreciate that. Thank you so much for supporting what we're attempting to do here and just talk about some things that are very serious and should have more of a limelight shit on it and not be kind of just shun away in a corner somewhere or in a closet. I think it's important that we talk about mental health. I think it's important that we talk about our struggles because how are we ever going to grow if we don't, right? But uh, from all of us here uh, at the Bat Cave, uh, I love you guys so much. And Chrissy, Tim, you guys are awesome. I will see you next time. Rolling it out, baby. Rolling it out. Here we go. Going to roll out that new promo. Boom. Oh, that's that's no, that's Tim's comrade. Tim Conrad's promo. What are we doing here? I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I'm so confused. Anyway. <laughs>